What does the future of Pinellas County look like? Safer, more convenient ways to get around. Better use of our land to house people and preserve nature. A community where everyone can thrive. To help plan for the future, the state of Florida requires all local governments to maintain a comprehensive plan. The plan is not a rule book. It's a guide for public policy. It helps our leaders make wise decisions about issues that affect all of us, like land use, transportation, natural resource conservation, and more. After a long process of coordinated review, public meetings, and other outreach, Pinellas County is updating our comprehensive plan. It's called Plan Pinellas. You can view the entire proposed plan online now at plan.pinellas.gov. Want to learn more? Explore the future at plan.pinellas.gov. All right, good afternoon, everyone. We want to thank you so much for uh, spending your lunch hour with us today. Uh, my name is Josh Boatwright. I'm with the Communications Department here at Pinellas County Government. Uh, we're here today to talk about the proposed Plan Pinellas, which is the first update to our countywide comprehensive comprehensive plan in, in some number of years. It's a very important topic and we appreciate your, your interest in it. There's gonna be some opportunities to <clears throat> learn about specific areas of the plan today, as well as at a webinar tomorrow. If you're not signed up, we're gonna be having two webinars. Uh, today's webinar is gonna be specifically about uh, chapters of the plan, including future land use, economic prosperity, housing, and transportation. Uh, and tomorrow we'll be covering um, environment, conservation, coastal management, surface water, and recreation and open space. Um, what you're gonna learn today is kind of an overview of what <clears throat> our comprehensive plan does and what it does not do, uh, how it functions within our, our county government and impacts planning for unincorporated Pinellas County. Uh, now, it's gonna be kind of a high level discussion today. We're gonna talk generally about some of the goals of the plans, the principles, how we arrived at those principles and goals, and, uh, and, and, and just generally how those are going to shape uh, the future of Pinellas County. Uh, we are gonna have an opportunity to answer some questions. Um, and uh, we would ask that you keep any questions uh, on topic to uh, the comprehensive plan. And we'll note that um, we're gonna do, uh, we're going to, over the next couple of months, really try to respond to comments that come in about the comprehensive plan, particularly during these webinars. If you have specific questions about policy level issues, please feel free to ask them. Uh, if they're real detailed, we may get back to you. We're going to be, um, our staff is going to be looking into those more detailed questions and responding to any comments we get after the fact. And if you're registered for the webinar, we've got your email address and we'll let you know when that's available. Uh, but if you have kind of some general questions you'd like to get answered today, you can use the Q&A feature uh, down at the bottom of your screen to type in any questions you may have during the presentation. And then after uh, the main presentation, we'll have uh, a little bit of time to answer some of those questions live. Um, so today um, we have with us uh, Rebecca Stonefield and Evan Johnson from the Planning Division of uh, Pinellas County's Housing and Community Development Department. Uh, Rebecca is going to start our, our day off talking a little bit about the comprehensive plan overall and uh, how we got to Plan Pinellas. Rebecca? Hi everyone, uh, welcome. Thank you so much for joining us today. We're excited to share um, this new plan with you guys. Um, I'm gonna uh, kind of give you a brief overview of why we have comprehensive plans um, and what their role is for the county and for a local jurisdiction. We're gonna get into a bit about um, how we uh, set up the foundation for updating our, our comprehensive plan and move into some of the topics a little bit. Um, so why do we have a comprehensive comprehensive plan? Well, it's actually state mandated, and um, through the Florida state statutes, uh, the state is intending to try to manage growth. Uh, we have a lot of different jurisdictions within um, within the state, and obviously within our our county. And how do we coordinate together? How do we uh, coordinate growth efforts and ensure that we have facilities that help support growth? Um, local jurisdictions also want to encourage how to best and uh, to best use land that they have and the resources. Um, so 
Next slide, please. Right. So, so what is a comprehensive plan? What role does it serve? So communities and local jurisdictions will identify things they want to achieve for their community. What are their goals for the community? Um, it can relate to housing and, and job growth and transportation and a lot of different issues. So they think about these goals and the, and the vision for their community and who they want to be. And what the comprehensive plan does is it establishes policies for those different issues. It outlines the policies by which decisions will be made. And what that leads into is once you've established those policies in the comprehensive plan, you then move forward with implementation tools, whether that's your land development code or how you choose to invest uh, in the community and in infrastructure, how you collaborate with your partners and so forth. And it's through those additional implementation tools that we then hopefully achieve our goals. So it's the cycle, establish goals, establish policies to achieve those goals within the comp plan, and then out of that comes how you implement the plan. So Plan Pinellas, this, this update, why did we do it? So our last major update to our comprehensive plan happened back in 2008. And typically a community is going to want to look at their comprehensive plan every eight to 10 years or so, or if there's a very specific issue um, that you, you recognize you need to shift policy in, um, you'll, you'll review it. Um, so again, it's been a while since we've looked at ours as a whole, uh, and so it was time to do that. Currently, our plan has over 1,100 policies. If, if you could go back for one moment, thank you. Um, we have a pretty large document, and sometimes across the different chapters, there's repetitive language. So we may state the same policy or get to the same policy with a little bit different language across the different chapters within the plan, and we'll get into those a little bit, the chapters, a little bit later. Also, as I mentioned, um, co comprehensive plans are intended to be policy oriented, not necessarily regulatory. And we have a little bit of that mixed in as well currently. And we wanted to make sure that we um, appropriately utilize the document to express our policies and not be regulatory in nature. Um, in addition, um, there were some organizational issues of how we classify a policy versus an action to take, we take to fulfill a policy, things like that. So it was really intended to look at it broadly, clean up the document, and focus our policies a little bit more. Also, the community has changing needs. Um, so the population in Pinellas County continues to grow and is, is expected to do so well into the future. Um, we have, like many uh, other communities across the country, we have uh, affordable housing needs. How do we house all of our residents um, and population in, in an affordable way? Um, over a third of our population is either what we refer to as cost burdened or severely cost burdened. And what that essentially means is that a household is not supposed to, for the most part, be contributing more than 30% of their household income towards housing, but a large population, uh, uh, sorry, a large, large portion of our households are, are exceeding that. Additionally, um, we are a built out community, as, as a lot of you know. Um, we don't have a lot of vacant land to develop anew, and what vacant land we do have are really small parcels and wouldn't uh, lend themselves to large uh, new development. So how do we look at these policies from the vein of redevelopment? As well as we have uh, many sustainable and sustainability and resiliency issues um, with uh, potential for flooding impacts and other things, and we want to make sure we're addressing those issues um, that as we move forward and we looked at the policies. So where did we start? Uh, we didn't just start by looking at the specific policies and saying, how do we wanna revise them? We really started by trying to define the vision and set the foundation by which the policies would be drafted. So we looked at a lot of our existing documents today that have gone through some sort of community input process. We've looked at a lot of citizen survey results. Um, we um, kind of looked at what are those underlying themes that are consistent. And we came up with an, uh, a focused uh, number of guiding principles, so eight guiding principles. And I'll get into those in a little bit in a moment. Um, but we've, we vetted those um, with the community. We held open houses, did a few presentations. Um, we, we started the original Plan Pinellas uh, website, which shared a little bit more in depth about the guiding principles and their intentions. And we um, launched surveys to make sure that the community 
uh, was really that we were in line with what the community wanted. So I'd like to talk a little bit about each of the individual guiding principles um, briefly. Um, so what you'll notice as I'm talking through them is that they are pretty much interrelated. When I talk about one, you'll hear, hear the connection between some of the others. And that's also how we approached our policies um, when we were drafting the revisions. These topics you can't really look at in a vacuum. You have to see how they relate. So what the guiding principles do is that they set the foundation of when we draft the policies, do they align with this division that these guiding principles creates? So our first principle is that of sustainable future. So how do we make sure we have a balanced, sustainable um, system of our economy, of our social environments, meaning um, you know, access to amenities and resources, our environmental needs, are we, are we um, addressing potential flooding impacts from climate issues and so forth? And so we wanted to make sure there's a balance of those needs. Um, very directly related to that are healthy communities. And it's really about that same system, but how do we ensure that all of our residents and all of our visitors have access and options within, within the community? Um, access to jobs, access to homes, affordable homes, um, access to parks, um, and that there are options within that system as well. And so our next guiding principle is focuses more closely to the strong local economy. Not only do we have the range of job opportunities that will uh, meet the needs of our community, but do we have them at varying wages and, and, and it can and meet the needs of our businesses as the workforce well-trained to attract businesses and retain our businesses? And um, are we uh, coordinate, coordinating that effort? Our next one is housing options. You will hear about this a lot. Um, and again, that's not just about the costs associated with housing, but are the types and sizes that are being brought into the county meeting the needs. And so um, we have a very large portion of our population that is um, of our households that are one or two person households. And so do we have the right uh, housing stock to meet those needs? So we look at that as a whole as well. Multimodal transportation, very important. Um, and we're emphasizing um, safety in our multimodal transportation? Are we not just looking at um, car travel, which obviously is important, but are we looking at how the system also accommodates the pedestrian and bike facilities and so forth? Resilient land use planning decisions for our natural resource protection. Um, so we have to stay on top of um, the data that we're getting about um, potential threats to our sea level rise and so forth. And are we protecting our animal and our um, plant habitats? Are, are we um, making land use decisions that also balances our, our natural resource protection needs? Best practices is our seventh um, guiding principle. And really the intention there is, is as we provide services and amenities to the community, we always wanna be thinking forward and, and what are the latest technologies or what are the best ways to provide those services to the community, but let's not just jump on the next big thing. Let's make sure that we're making decisions in a fiscally responsible manner. And then our last guiding principle is responsible regionalism. And really that is just re-emphasizing the fact that we need to coordinate with our partners, whether it's with the municipalities or it's with regional agencies or, or um, state agencies, as well as recognizing the notion that we need to make sure that we, we engage our community in planning efforts as well. So those guiding principles set up the foundation for the review of our comprehensive plan. And the result of that are these chapters here. And so we'll be covering in the session today, um, future land use, economic prosperity, housing and transportation. Um, and then we'll also be uh, covering four additional chapters in tomorrow's session. I'll note that a lot of this introduction will be part of tomorrow's session as well for those who couldn't join on today, um, but the um, chapters we'll be addressing are these environmental ones. There are also additional chapters that we're not covering in these sessions, but they're very much part of the document, and you can note that at the bottom of the slide, and that is our utilities like potable water and wastewater. We have a, session, um, a chapter devoted to our solid waste and recycling. Uh, lifelong learning, which um, addresses not only how we interact with the school district, 
but that we want to emphasize coordination on workforce training and things like that to help support the economy. And then we have a governance section that talks about more about how we coordinate with our partners um, and move forward in that direction. And one thing I just want to reemphasize again that as we looked at these policies, and, and this is um, probably the biggest part of our what's new about this comp plan is that we very much um, look at the relationship across topics. So in one chapter, you'll notice that not only are we talking about future land use, but how does that relate to our economic environment? How does it relate to housing or our transportation decisions? But it's focused along the, the uh, perspective of land use. And that's just one example, and we do that throughout. Um, so with that, I will actually hand this session off to our next speaker, our planning manager, Evan Johnson. Thanks, Rebecca. Um, as Rebecca did such a good job giving you kind of that overview of how we got to where we are today with this draft plan, my job, which seems pretty impossible, is to cover four of the main chapters of the draft plan in uh, 15 minutes. So any of you who are here today who understand comprehensive planning know that this is um, not possible uh, to do in a, a very detailed manner, but I'm gonna do the best to try to talk about some of those major changes or shifts, um, as well as uh, you know a little bit of the, uh, the, the interconnectedness between the different elements or chapters as we now call them uh, throughout the document. Next slide. So first, I want to start with some of those community challenges. Now, Rebecca has covered a couple of these in her earlier slides, um, and I'm only going to touch on them briefly here today. Um, but these community challenges really are um, kind of a distillation of what the uh, four chapters that I'll be going over today really address. So first, of course, um, anybody who is living in or working in Pinellas County understands the challenges we have with affordable housing. And it's really not just um, the affordability of the housing itself, it's the type of housing, the uh, variety that's available, um, as well as the location of housing. And as we think about these things, you know, the unincorporated area is very, um, is spread out across the physical county itself. And so we need to think about housing as something that needs to be addressed throughout the unincorporated county, um, because each one of those areas have different needs um, and, uh, different economic development needs and different housing needs. Uh, economic opportunities, we'll talk a little bit about the economic prosperity chapter, um, thinking specifically about not only target industries, which are those kind of traditional major, say above average wage um, jobs and industries, but also looking at other opportunities that we might have, um, you know, as we continue to grow, um, we want to make sure that we have uh, new industries moving in and uh, how can we do that from a comp planning perspective? We'll talk a little bit about that. Uh, transportation safety and access. Uh, we, we continue to be one of the more um, safety or challenged uh, jurisdictions. The region itself is has always, unfortunately, uh, one of the top uh, regions when it comes to bike ped, ped, uh, pedestrian accidents and uh, crashes and fatalities. So, you know, we need to address that. And as we'll talk about later, it's all interconnected then also with how, you know, the housing, the land use and all those other things are addressed as well. And then the last two, um, you know, being in Pinellas County, you always hear we have limited land to develop. Uh, so uh, we won't talk about that. I think uh, Rebecca had a great slide with the 1500 acres. Um, so, with that being said, we do have limited land. Uh, and so really our entire plan is focused on the idea of redevelopment and how do we get redevelopment right uh, moving forward um, by integrating strategies um, throughout the entire plan document itself. Next slide, please. So first, um, I did wanna briefly touch on this idea of the interconnectedness of the different systems within the plan and the fact that we really are working to tell the story of those relationships um, uh, in this plan update itself. So while we have individual chapters, really everything is interconnected. And so when you, um, because I do expect you all will go to our website and check it out in more detail, but when you go to the website, you'll definitely see, um, be given more uh, illustrations as to how these different uh, topics 
uh, connect to each other and how the plan relates throughout how each policy relates to the other. So just looking at housing, if you center on housing, um, you know, how does housing relate to jobs? Well, it really has to do with making sure that we have the right amount of housing and the right types of housing near employment, um, making sure that uh, new industries and new employers who want to move to the county, they're going to be looking to make sure that we have housing supply available for their workforce. Um, housing to mobility, again, how we connect uh, to our housing and how we connect to and from uh, housing, whether that be via a uh, single occupancy uh, vehicle, bike, pedestrian, transit, um, how do we serve those daily needs with our transportation system? And then education, of course, not only uh, connecting to our school system, but also our uh, community colleges, our colleges and universities, as well as our technical training centers. Um, it's really important to make sure that if somebody um, is trying to better themselves or we have a workforce who's getting educated, uh, that when we provide those opportunities, we also make sure that they can live near uh, nearby those opportunities. And then finally, livability, when we look at where new housing is going to be going or where new amenities are going to be going, making sure that there's a connection um, so that if you live in an area, you have uh, relatively easy access to park and open space, natural spaces, cultural amenities, et cetera. So this is very much a theme. You could take any one of these um, gears uh, here on this illustration, center them, and then really uh, expand that conversation for each and every one of these. And that's really a you know, driving tenant of Plan Pinellas. Next slide. So I'm going to start first with the establishment of the growth framework. Um, so uh, for those of you who are familiar with our current uh, comprehensive plan, um, there is a lot of uh, over-regulatory um, language throughout um, and a lot of extra detail in several areas that really when we're trying to step back and make it a more policy um, plan, a policy level plan, um, that we've, we've kind of trimmed it down and we've removed. Um, but the framework that remains uh, and really gets emphasized in this plan is one of development of activity centers, uh, multimodal corridors, and mixed use development. So taking those one by one, um, in activity centers, what does that really mean? Well, on your left here, or my left, I guess I should say, you'll see this is an illustration from the uh, Gateway Master Plan, which was a joint effort between Pinellas County, Ford Pinellas, I believe Pinellas Park, St. Pete, and Largo. Um, all work together on this plan since we all have uh, land within this larger gateway area. And what we really did was, you know, you have an area that's got large employers, it's got education and housing, but if we're going to grow within this area, um, how are we going to do that in a responsible way? How are we going to um, add housing in ways that um, make some of our like this here, our office parks um, and employment areas more viable moving forward. Um, what kind of infill and those types of things will um, increase walkability, improve efficiency of transit, those types of things. So that's when we're looking at activity centers um, and how we want to plan for them moving forward. The next one is a multimodal corridor, and this is something that comes from the countywide plan uh, from Forward Pinellas. Um, and we really want to make that a focus of our planning moving forward. So if you think of an activity center as kind of a, a node or an area like the gateway, the multimodal corridor concept is really, uh, think of that as a linear mixed use corridor. So um, it's a community that just happens to be much more linear along some of our major facilities, transportation facilities. So we want to focus growth in on those areas. We want to mix the uses better. Oftentimes on many of our larger corridors, um, it leans much more retail um, and commercial versus say residential. Um, so we want to make sure that we're planning holistically for um, to create kind of that community uh, along that uh, those corridors itself. And then it allows you to um, you know, connect transit um, and connect other multimodal transportation um, sort uh, modes. And then finally, mixed use development, that's kind of a theme that's been woven throughout the uh, document. And um, although we have removed some of the more regulatory guidance within the um, future land use element around like location of mixed use, et cetera, it's very much something that we are encouraging throughout um, our policies and strategies. And it's not only mixed use development from uh, different uses nearby, but it's also looking at are there opportunities for vertical mixed use, which would say you've got multiple uses in say a single building or something like that. That's pretty much the theme of that framework. Next slide. 
And then the next area of focus um, to address some of those challenges is this idea of community planning. And what we really mean by that as far as the plan, the plan kind of directs us to um, refine and develop and refine a process, a, a community planning process that can work at um, the neighborhood level, that can work at the street level, that can work at the level of the activity center or the corridor. And so really something that can be scaled up um, that uh, can be as needed, but can also be very much focused on a small area as, as if that's needed as well. So what does that really mean? Well, community planning not only addresses the land use and the comprehensive plan uh, facets, so the densities and intensities and general uses, but it also gives us an opportunity to really hone in and look a little bit more closely at some of the, say, public realm and urban design issues. So what do we mean by that? Well, it, this is a great image of a street frontage that incorporates a lot of those urban design public realm improvements. So uh, you have a bench street furniture, you've got street lighting and trees and shade, you've got a good side sidewalk and those types of things. So in a community plan really gets down, allows us the opportunity to plan at this level and provide some of that visual guidance uh, moving forward for some of our uh, communities. Um, healthy communities, uh, this type of planning allows us the opportunity to look at opportunities for uh, creating uh, activity or encouraging physical activity. Maybe that has to do with uh, parks and amenities. Maybe that has to do with, um, you know, some of the sidewalks and bike lanes and those types of facilities. It also um, brings up the issue of food access. And some of our communities are disadvantaged areas. There are issues of food access and the community planning efforts will allow us to focus on that. Um, the Board of County Commissioners has taken a very proactive role um, with uh, health and all policies. And we um, continue, will continue to build on that health and all policies effort to ensure that we're, we're looking at healthy communities and, and public health throughout our planning moving forward. And then finally, the last piece of the puzzle is gonna be uh, the look and feel of the development that comes in itself. And I think the best example that I have of, of a recent kind of area where we've kind of followed this community planning process is downtown Palm Harbor where we have a master plan, um, which is an activity center. And we then took that, which was a comprehensive plan, densities and intensities, and we dug into and created a form-based code for what is a, you know, our, our historic district within the unincorporated county. So that's really what we're hoping to continue to uh, use these community planning processes um, for some of our communities and neighborhoods moving forward. Next slide. The next area of focus is gonna be housing. Um, and again, for all of you who are, um, well, if you don't have to be in the planning or governmental world to understand the challenges we have with affordability. But for all of you who are uh, working in this space, um, you know, whether that be is uh, working with nonprofits or other organizations or local government, you may be aware of some of the efforts that the county has been taking as it relates to affordable housing. So. Not only do we have our typical community development grants, uh, whether those be state or federal grants, we continue to implement those programs. We also have the Penny for Affordable Housing uh, Program, which is um, a amount of money that the Board of County Commissioners set aside uh, for the purposes of building and incentivizing affordable housing units. But in addition to those programs, which are very much, um, they're being implemented actively now, the Plan Pinellas Comp Plan um, also encourages and directs staff uh, to develop, uh, take other approaches to also encourage development of affordable attainable housing. So what do those look like? Those can be the regulatory incentives that could be looking at flexibility that we can build into our codes, um, reducing reduction in parking standards, uh, you know, changes in landscaping standards, et cetera. Uh, this idea of countywide cooperation, for those of you who um, are more engaged in government uh, here in Pinellas County, you're probably aware of the housing compact. Uh, the county has been working with some of the larger uh, jurisdictions here, uh, cities, to develop a housing compact, which is essentially an agreement to get on the same page and to collaborate when it comes to housing issues. Um, we've all recognized through these uh, this countywide cooperation that um, we need affordable, attainable housing. And frankly, as long as it's serving our employment centers, as long as it's serving our education area, um, educational needs, et cetera, doesn't really matter what jurisdiction it necessarily falls in. And so we want 
to create that cooperative model that helps us um, accomplish getting more housing throughout the county. Um, and us, we in Pinellas County and Plan Pinellas it continues to support that effort. Innovative, innovative approaches, this can mean a variety of things, everything from tiny homes to uh, how do we incorporate tiny homes into uh, our zoning code and allow for some of the uniqueness and unique issues that um, uh, kind of follow that. Um, uh, accessory dwelling units, um, we've allowed accessory dwelling units in the county for um, some time now, but how do we make it more successful and a more viable uh, use or viable housing use? So that's something that it, the plan directs us in, in that area to, to dig into that and to update our code and so forth necessary to encourage uh, more uh, ADUs and other approaches. And then finally, quality and safety. Um, it's important that our housing stock, whether that be affordable or otherwise, is uh, of a quality, um, is, is of a quality, is, is healthy, is safe, and our plan points in those, in those directions to ensure whether that be manufactured housing communities or whether that be other um, older affordable housing that we are focused in is ensuring that it is the best housing that it can be for our residents. Next slide. Um, it, Another focus area of the plan is uh, this idea of inclusive economic growth. Um, so traditionally in the comprehensive plan for the unincorporated county, we have long focused on target industries and this idea of industries that are provide above average wages um, are in certain er um, professional areas that uh, we feel we have a locational advantage um, that could be manufacturing, aerospace, um, biomedical research. Um, the list is a constantly evolving list. But the goal is to bring those industries in because those are going to bring higher wage jobs that then help feed the economy um, and feed other uh, professional professions. Um, but in addition to that, um, one area we've really kind of expanded and changed is to, is to look into, well, how do we then reuse um, uh, some of these areas that have maybe no longer provide the type of spaces that a target industry would need? but still could be very viable for small businesses, for retail, for uh, you know, restaurants or other, other uses that could still provide for jobs um, and opportunities like that. So uh, in addition to the plan now is to focus on how do we go about encouraging adaptive reuse, whether that be through incentives or regulatory uh, flexibility, um, and also looking at the potential of building small business programs we have done some work in um, like our Loman CRA, uh, as have many other CRAs throughout the county, they're trying to encourage and support small business. Um, and then finally, training and education, a theme that um, we hit on in much more detail as it relates to the lifelong learning chapter. But it, even as far as economic development, we realize that having a workforce that is an educated, trained work workforce is going to be um, one of the big attractors for new employers in the future. And so making sure that we create those opportunities um, is something that our economic prosperity chapter is very focused on. And next slide. And then finally, uh, transportation. So safe and efficient mobility. And this idea that um, we're shifting uh, uh, our focus a bit or maybe refining our focus to be much more uh, focused on the idea of transportation safety um, throughout our comprehensive plan update. And so what is that, um, how do we do that and how are we planning on doing that through the comp plan? Well, first and foremost, uh, the idea of connecting transportation and land use. And again, if you're in uh, government and, and within planning, I'm sure you've uh, recognized this and understand what we're talking about. But if you think about the idea of investing in a new transportation piece of infrastructure, so a new road, um, an improved road, expanded new transit um, infrastructure, if you look at that, then how do we make sure that the investment that we're about to put in the ground literally is supported by land uses um, around it, at the densities and intensities that basically maximize the efficiency of that new infrastructure? So this really is a matter of uh, efficiency. Um, and ultimately will get us the best bang for our buck when it comes to investment in new roadways and other infrastructure. Um, bike and pedestrian, I mentioned earlier about our issues with crashes and uh, bike and ped injuries and fatalities. That is something that is woven again throughout the transportation discussion uh, in the plan. Transit access, 
um, not only making sure that our development, uh, that we are supporting transit uh, system improvements and expansions, but also that we Sorry about that, not quite sure how that happened. Um, but also that um, the uh, looking at transit access uh, in that it would, um, not only do we have support for new systems of transit and new transit service, but also that we have created, um, we've got the right regulatory uh, requirements and so forth to support new transit facilities moving forward. Um, the airport expansion, um, we support the Clearwater, uh, St. Pete Clearwater Airport. It is within the unincorporated county and we are, um, we are not only supportive and the plan is not only supportive of their uh, expansion as an airport, but also some of the abutting and adjacent lands that are also county or airport owned. How do we make those more active from an economic development perspective uh, moving forward? And then finally, one last topic that we touch on um, quite a bit is this idea of micromobility. And what does, you know, if you've been around any of our, uh, our transit uh, or our trails um, in the recent days or recent years, you've seen a plethora of, uh, we've got electronic bikes, we've got scooters and those types of things. And so we understand that this is a reality moving forward. And frankly, it can be a very important part of the, a transportation system, but how do we address it from a regulatory standpoint? And the plan really points us to look into strategies and uh, regulatory change that will support those uh, types of uh, transportation uh, alternatives. Um, next slide. And with that, I believe I'm gonna hand it back over to Josh. Yeah, thanks, Evan. <clears throat> um, so just a quick overview of what's happening next with the plan. Um, as has been mentioned, uh, Plan Pinellas has already gone through a pretty long process of you know, public input and creating a vision and consolidating these policies. So really this is kind of the last step of public engagement before the plan goes to the Board of County Commissioners, which is uh, scheduled to happen um, at the uh, begin the, toward the end of this year, beginning of next year. And uh, we're on schedule to have the, the BCC adopt the plan by the spring. Uh, those will be through a couple of public hearings. So there'll be other opportunities uh, to engage uh, at those times. But in the meantime, what's really important is uh, this website, plan.pinellas.gov. Um, if you are interested in sharing a comment, uh, obviously we'll have a question and answer session in just a moment, uh, but you can also go on the website and share a comment on the website. You can see uh, where to do that on this slide. Uh, there's a, um, a button on the upper bar for make a comment. So please feel free to leave a comment there. Uh, that's really important. It's, this is a community effort to create a comprehensive plan that really reflects uh, what Pinellas County citizens are looking for in the future and, and what's a sustainable future for us. So uh, please, uh, please go on, uh, take a look at the plan uh, and, and, and share your comments. Um, I think we, um, I wanna mention something real quick about uh, question and answer. And we're, before we jump into the question and answer, I think we're gonna take a minute to actually show you all the website uh, so that you can uh, have, a, have a look at where you can look at all the plan chapters to get more detail. Obviously, as both Evan and Rebecca said, this is a very, uh, a very detailed plan. We, we've um, narrowed it down to make it uh, easier to digest and understand for, for our residents. Uh, and more clear, but there's still a lot to it. And so uh, we encourage you to go on the website and uh, take a look. It's, it's designed in this case, rather than being a big uh, document that's uh, on paper that you have to go through um, line by line, it's more interactive and you can kind of see how the different elements work together uh, on the website. Um, so uh, in, a, in just a moment, I'll ask uh, Rebecca to, to share her screen with the website, but um, I just wanna mention with the question and answer again, if you have some questions, we have a little bit of time left uh, during our webinar today. So um, please use the Q&A feature to drop any questions you may have in there. Like I said, we're gonna try to answer any kind of high level questions about the plan, what it does, uh, the goals. If you have any real particular specific policy questions, we'll attempt to answer those. 
uh, after this meeting, and uh, we'll be sending out a notification when those uh, when those uh, responses are are ready to view. Um, so with that, um, Rebecca, do you want to uh, jump back on and, and uh, show the the website for a moment? You bet. I'll just share my screen. Um, I think I need permission to do that. Okay, you should be able to do it now. It's um, I think because I had it on, it was probably uh. Okay, I think I got it. Let me just make sure I can see it. Okay. All right, great. Um, so yeah, I really just wanted to walk you through this new website that we've created for the document itself. Um, and when you uh, launch to the to the main page, you're, this is what you're going to see. Um, we have this, obviously these sessions being advertised right now, um, but there are diff a few different ways we can navigate through the site. Um, I'll start just by showing you some of these tabs because I think these are, are convenient. Um, at the very top, if you wanted to, and you have the opportunity to review the document, if you have any comments or what have you, you can access it through this make a comment tab and there'll be another way you can access that as well. Um, and I'll share that with you. Um, then we have a public events uh, site, which our uh, page, which is probably how you registered for this event, and we'll be posting any um, public events that will be happening there. We link over to the current comp plan on the county website if you wanted to, to look at existing policies that are not uh, necessarily this, this update itself, and then um, a contact, contact us tab. And then man, um, maneuvering through the, the document itself, there are a few different ways you can do that. Um, if you wanted to see the full document kind of as um, a, a flipbook sort of um, framework, um, you just click the plan uh, tab at the top of the site. And that will get you through the full, the full document if you wanted to review it that way. Um, but what we've attempted to do also, and I'll go back to the main page, did that by clicking this logo up here. I'm gonna scroll down a little bit towards, uh, towards the bottom where we have the individual chapter pages linked. And so if you wanted to look at something like future land use, you would just select it there. And there's a, a bit of information on this page. First, it just kind of explains what the chapter, what the subject chapter will be about. It um, shares some everyday actions, what um, you as a community member can participate in or do, or different practices you could do to help us meet the goals of the document. And then there are two ways you can um, review the policies themselves. Um, the first is, well, we give kind of an example of what each individual goal is about, and this is the language associated with that goal. And if you want to learn more about, say, economic growth in the future land use section, you would then just select that goal here and it drops down. So you'll see the uh, defined objectives, policies, and strategies. And I'll just quickly mention that um, the goal is the broad, vision of what you're trying to achieve. The objective is really what is that kind of almost measurable outcome that, you, that will help us meet that goal. The policy is kind of the standard or, or, or you know, what guides our decisions? What do, we, what do we say we're trying to do in order to, to achieve that goal? And then strategies are a kind of example action items or things that we will do to carry out that policy, again, with the ultimate intention of um, accomplishing what we're trying to accomplish. Another way you can see individual policies by, um, by the chapter is here. If you know what policy or strategy you're looking for, if I was looking to review objective 5.3, this will bring you right there. So it's a couple of different ways to navigate through. And then again, each chapter page will have maybe some background information associated with it. Um, and here is another opportunity to make a comment. It will bring you back to that same make a comment page, but it's another way to quickly um, get over there. And if you want to maybe make a comment directly associated with that section, just reference the policy and we'll, we'll note that as well. So then you can always go back to the main page by clicking this logo. Um, and then there are a few different ways. Um, these, these broad, I would almost call them um, the pillars of the, of, of the community actually, housing, jobs, education, mobility. 
livability, really those amenities and services that help us um, and things we want access to um, are categorized this way. If you wanted to see um, the chapters associated with livability, it's just another way to ac access those chapter pages. Um, so that's that's the, the main flow of, of the site. Um, and again, um, if there are any questions about that, I'd be happy to answer those. Um, but I will um, stop sharing at this point. Thanks, Rebecca. And I guess if, uh, Rebecca, if you and Evan want to turn your, your cameras and uh, microphones back on, we have a couple of questions coming in. So, um, okay. So, uh, one question I wanted to just start off with just to get the conversation going is, you know, how, how does, um, how does this update of the comprehensive plan differ from what we had uh, or what we have currently? Yeah, um, so I, I'd say um, the biggest differences are, are, are a number of the things that we touched on and in the way we approached the document, stressing that interrelationship um, of issues and, and making sure that as you're considering, um, you're considering one specific topic or, or, or issue, that you never lose sight of those other issues that, that are um, related. Um, that's a big part of the organization and how we addressed um, the documents. Um, also, Evan kind of touched on the fact that we really want to focus growth, anticipated growth in these activity centers and, and corridors um, and things like that. Uh, one thing I don't think I brought up too much and I think Evan touched on is this new approach of, of health in all policies. And really what that means is, um, how are you considering healthy uh, outcomes for the community um, through policy? And so when we reviewed policies, do these remain, um, what changes, what have you, that was also in the back of our mind of, is this gonna help us move towards healthy outcomes for the community? Um, there's a, and there's also um, an equity factor to that. And are we meeting the needs uh, of all of our residents and, and are we improving access and, and things like that. So I think the biggest changes was really how we approached the drafting of the document. And I would just add to that, I mean, I think um, substantial work has been done to reduce and remove that overlap. Uh, so the redundant policies and things like that. And, you know, these comp plans have over years and years basically just built on the old plan, you know, and so we end up getting something as, as Becca mentioned with 1100 policies. And so I think there's been a lot of effort to streamline. Um, and so just from a readability standpoint and an accessibility standpoint, it is um, a much more understandable and, um, you know, accessible type of document now. It's a lot easier to get. The language has been simplified. The regulatory language has been removed. I think that's a big change. And the other part is just how we're going to deliver it. Um, this website is not a completed version of the website. Ultimately, we will continue to refine it uh, to make it as easy as possible for residents to understand and see how the different policies work together and how it all comes together to uh, accomplish our guiding principles. So I think just in the ability to use it and access the document and not have to just pull up a PDF of a given chapter is a big difference that will ultimately um, uh, make it something that a lot more people have it, uh, access to and understand. Um, so another question came up uh, about, uh, there's a, are there any policy updates that specifically address density and intensity increases in the coastal high hazard area? So currently in the draft plan that we have now, we haven't changed our current uh, policy framework. So at this time, we haven't made any further changes than what's already um, from what's there now. So we have policies and, and Becca probably remembers exactly where it is in the current plan uh, and the new plan, but we do have policy that limits uh, increases in density within the coastal uh, high hazard area, um, but doesn't necessarily reduce um, or remove uh, development rights or density within that area at this time. Um, it's certainly, um, the plan does direct us to continue to look at strategies 
related to resiliency and uh, floodplain management and all of that, um, which you'll hear more about tomorrow. Um, but it doesn't specify, you know, specific to density or intensity. There's a lot of different strategies and approaches that um, we'll be looking at moving forward. Okay. Um, another question we had was just about terminology. Um, one person was asking um, if there's a glossary of terms that are that are used that are you know planning terms or just uh, maybe some guidance on you know if you're not familiar with planning language how to how to best navigate the, the new plan panelists. Yeah, um, so where you'll find um, the glossary is actually associated with the future land use chapter. And if you can remember on the side, on the left-hand side of the page, um, you could drop down to specific policies. Well, underneath that, there is another um, section that's called categories and rules, uh, category, category and rule descriptions or something to that effect. And in there, there's a glossary of a lot of the terms we use. Um, and so that's usually what we would refer to. Right. Um, what about uh, art and culture? Where does that factor into plant analysis? So our, res our uh, recreation, open space, and cultural element, uh, culture element um, addresses that, and it talks about um, be, um, improving our tracking and our documenting of historic resources. It talks uh, about um, art programs a bit and how we could incorporate in that to some of our planning efforts. Um, and that's, so that's one section. And then I believe also even in our economic development section, we relate it to um, the art community a bit or, or different programs that maybe we could pursue. Right. Um, another question we had was about uh, issues of, you know, resolving uh, equity disparities in the community, um, specifically, uh, you know, how the county plan uh, gives a framework for actions like traffic routes, housing quality, public transit, and trying to resolve, you know, uh, inequities that have been present in the community uh, uh, to the present day. Yeah. I'm go sorry, Evan, if you want to go ahead. Go and take... go um, so I actually really appreciate that question because I don't think we really use the term equity too much in our, in our presentation, but it's definitely part of the plan. And um, when you want to focus on the transportation system, you really need to take into account who are the users of the system where you're planning uh, the facilities. And as you do that, um, you are directly responding to the needs of that community. Um, Evan, I don't know if you want to expand on that at all, but, um, but it's definitely part of our, uh, it's wrapped up into the plan. Yeah, and I mean, I think if you look at, um, over the last couple of years, whether it be most recently the Safe Streets Resolution, uh, the Housing Compact that I mentioned earlier, the Health and All Policies Resolution that the board passed a couple of years ago, you know, really baked into all of those is making sure that as we move forward and we're making decisions around investment that the county is going to be making, that we that equity is going to be front and center and figuring out um, uh, it. As, as the question alludes to, you know, the plan, plan Pinellas is a framework and it gives that kind of initial direction. And I think what we've been doing as staff and as the board is, is furthering that and refining that through the compact and bringing these resolutions forward and the work that Ford Pinellas is doing in equity also is really important. So I think it's something, it's baked into basically everything we're doing now um, in our goal. Uh, and I, I do, want Becca to talk a little bit more about this. I mean, I think our goal is to continue to track that progress in a very public way so that you as the resident, as the reader, um, can, can, can see how we're doing, can see uh, how we're actually um, um, creating or um, hopefully making some change in those areas. Yeah, I can, I can add to that. Um, so uh, what Evan is referring to is that we really are, we're in the process of and really want to um, tie metrics to uh, the document. And that doesn't necessarily mean that every policy is gonna have a measure or a metric associated with it, but it's really finding where those interrelationships exist and what is the right, right way to determine, are we achieving that? Um, kind of the struggle that, that we can have is that a lot of these results are long-term. This doesn't happen 
tomorrow, this doesn't happen necessarily next year. It's a, it's a long-term effort and a lot of factors play into uh, achieving our goals. Um, and, that, and that's the trick, but um, how we define the correct measures uh, allow us to see what progress we're making towards our end goal and also allow us to almost be a check and balance. Do we have the right policy in place to get there? Um, so that's something that we definitely intend to tie to this document. So one other question, uh, where, where are public libraries in the plan? How do those factor in? Yeah, I don't think we have direct um, policies for libraries, but we definitely, um, I believe, refer to them as a community partner, especially when it comes to our, our um, lifelong learning section and how do we coordinate with them and how do we um, work with them as a resource for uh, education and training in the community. And I, I would just add to that, that in the unincorporated county, because library, we don't have a comprehensive system that only is, you know, county funded unincorporated county. And, you know, we have uh, some improvement districts with like in Palm Harbor that are able to provide libraries. And that's kind of a, a bit more of a scattered resource throughout the unincorporated county. But of course, there's also library resources that everyone has access to, you know, in the cities and so forth as well. So um, that's probably one of the reasons why it's not necessarily front and center, but we do, we do emphasize that idea of, you know, lifelong learning, access to internet, and those types of things that libraries very much can be part of providing. Great. Well, um, we're about out of time today, and uh, I would mention again, you know, if, if uh, uh, I, I think there were a couple of questions or comments that we'll be following up on uh, that were in the Q&A, and we will be doing that and sending out a message to everybody registered on the Zoom. Uh, to, to address those. Um, I did want to mention as well that uh, if you haven't signed up already, we are having another webinar tomorrow at the same time. You can sign up at plan.pinellas.gov. I'll be looking at more of the natural environment and what Plan Pinellas has to say uh, about some of those issues tomorrow. Definitely encourage you to take part. And uh, again, if you'd like to leave a, uh, other comments, uh, as uh, Re Rebecca showed, there are uh, easy ways to do that. Uh, on the website. I um, want to thank uh, Rebecca and Evan again for, for joining us today and, and, and taking us through these really important parts of Plan Pinellas. And, and thank you everyone for uh, taking a little time out of your lunch to uh, look into this really important issue. Have a great day. Thanks everyone.